to today's lesson where we will compare and contrast the strengths and weaknesses as well as the strategies of the North and South during the Civil War. Um, each side had definite strengths and definite weaknesses going into the war. And as we learn about the events of the war, it will be good for you guys to have a background in what these strengths, weaknesses, and strategies are so that uh, the events of the war um, are more easily understood by you. So your essential question would be, what were the strengths, weaknesses, and strategies of the North and South during the Civil War? And I will allow you to go ahead and write that down right now. So as you're setting up your chart, um, you're gonna probably wanna to create a T-chart with the north on the left and the south on the right. And we're gonna have three different categories. We're gonna have strengths, weaknesses, and strategies. So there will be three left side essential questions. So our first slide will be what were the strengths of the north? The next slide is gonna be what were the strengths of the south? Then we'll move on to weaknesses. Then we'll move on to strategies. So in terms of setting up your notes, uh, a T-chart would be the most effective. And our first left side question is, what were the strengths? And then you could put north in one column, south in the other. And I'll go ahead and give you some time to get that set up. So the north had the advantage that it already existed. It was the continuation of the government of the United States. So it had a functional government and it had a political system. The South essentially left the Union, left the North, so the North got the government of the United States. That was an advantage. Um, because Southern members of Congress had to leave the Congress of the United States, uh, Lincoln therefore had a very strong Republican Congress to support him because every state that seceded from the Union enjoyed the South, they no longer had senators they no longer had members of the House of Representatives to represent them in the, the United States because they were basically no longer part of the United States. And the North was overwhelmingly dominated by Republicans. Uh, the North, as you learned when we looked at the North and the South in terms of their culture, um, the North had a high industrial capacity and could manufacture what was needed for the war very, very easily. Uh, the South did not have that capacity. Uh, the North also had a much larger population. So if you're talking war, if you're talking soldiers, uh, the more people you have, the more able-bodied men you have, uh, the more potential soldiers you have, and therefore numerically, the greater the advantage you have. And the North also had a very intricate railroad and telegraph system. The telegraph was brand new, so the ability to communicate electronically, this was the first conflict in history in which the ability to communicate electronically um, created strategic advantages, and those advantages definitely uh, were on the Northern side. So for transportation and communication, uh, the North had a much more intricate and advanced system, as well as a strong Navy. And I will switch the slide in just a moment. So, moving over one column, what were the strengths of the South? So, if you do a T-chart, this will be your other column. And the South did have advantages. We also refer to the South as the Rebels or as the Confederacy. The South was fighting for its system and way of life, so its people were highly motivated to succeed. When they made the decision to withdraw from the United States and form their own country, they were basically doing exactly what the United States did when it rebelled against the British in 1776. If they were successful, they would um, achieve their dream and have their own society and their own government. Uh, and if they weren't successful, everything they were fighting for would be crushed. So they were very motivated. Uh, all the South had to do was defend their own territory. They were not looking to conquer the North. They were simply looking to survive 
and to exist. Um, whereas the North had to conquer the South. Totally different dynamic. The South had the advantage of having very, very good military commanders, and their soldiers were generally well-trained because the South had a strong military tradition. Uh, that is the case even today. Uh, there is a disproportionate number of soldiers and generals in the military who come from the South because that has always been a strength and a facet of Southern culture um, that has been strong. Um, many Southerners also have Germanic roots, and the Germans have a very strong military tradition. Um, the South also knew that if they lost, they would become a conquered province, and their way of life would be destroyed. So if everything you believe in, and if everything you care about is on the line, uh, you are going to tend to fight uh, much harder. Just like in the Revolutionary War, the United States had a much greater incentive to win, the British had to travel across the ocean and they were essentially fighting on foreign soil. Uh, for the Southerners, they were defending their home soil, their own way of life, and if they lost, everything they were fighting for would be lost as well. Moving on to the next slide. So the next question is, what were the weaknesses of the North, the Union? And they did have weaknesses, even though you know, most of us know the end result. It's still important to reflect on this. Uh, the North was not completely unified. There were many in the North who believed that the South should simply be allowed to go its own way, and that if without Southern senators and without Southern members of Congress, that the North could actually have its own society and its own way of life and, and that that would be hunky-dory and perfectly fine and let them go do their thing. We don't have to worry about them anymore. That was, uh, it was not a majority attitude, but it was a very strongly held belief and opinion in the North. Uh, the North, also known as the Union, had to go and conquer over half the country and force it back into the United States against its will. Uh, that is a pretty tall order, um, especially when half your country has just left. You essentially have to organize yourself to invade that half of the country, take it over, and occupy it because the people who live there don't want you there. That's a problem. Uh, the North also had to keep border states, so states like Maryland, states like Kentucky, states like Missouri, that still allowed slavery in the Union or risk having Washington, D.C. surrounded by Confederate states. Maryland was a slave state. Kentucky, which controlled the Ohio River, was a slave state. Missouri, which controlled very strategic places along the Mississippi and Missouri Rivers, was a very strategic state. So even though those states had sympathies with the Confederacy, um, they were essentially forced to remain in the Union, um, partially against their will. There was, there was definitely mixed opinion in those states, but if those states had joined the Confederacy, uh, the chances of the North winning would have been substantially reduced. And the North also had to maintain its will to fight, even despite losses and challenging times. And at the beginning of the war, uh, the North lost quite a few battles, as we will learn. So the next question we have is, what were the weaknesses of the South? What were the weaknesses of the Confederacy? Let's have a conversation about that. Um, the states of the South did not want the Confederate government to have much power or authority. The states maintained most control. Uh, the big theme of the Confederacy was states' rights. So having left the United States, having essentially left the U.S. Constitution, which gave a lot of power to the federal government, they wanted to create something that was much more akin to the Articles of Confederation, where the individual states of the Confederacy actually had more power than the central government. Uh, if you are trying to prosecute and win a war, that is not a good situation. Um, the South also did not have the resources the North had to replace lost and damaged military equipment. So the South was never stronger than on the first day of the war because as the war went on, they did not have the ability to replace 
what and who they lost. Keep in mind they had a smaller population and they had 10% of the industrial base that the North had. That's a big deal. And I just referred to this in the last bullet point, the South had a smaller population. So if you lost soldiers, you did not have a large pool of uh, young, able-bodied men to replace those soldiers with. The North could sustain much more loss than the South uh, and still be able to prosecute the war. So that was a very big deal. Also, the South did not have the technology and the transportation systems to compete with the North. They did not have the telegraph, and a lot of the Southern railroads were different gauges, so you couldn't take cars from one set of tracks and move them to another set of tracks because they had a different width to them. So rivers were pretty much the only way Southerners could get things from point A to point B. Uh, the North had a much more efficient and effective uh, system of communication and transportation. So that was a substantial weakness of the South. And finally, the South was isolated and not recognized by the countries of the world. They basically tore themselves away from the United States and said, we are our own country, but uh, no one around the world recognized that they were their own country. They were There were some countries that wanted to, the British would have been perfectly happy with it, but they wanted to see if the South could win some battles and potentially win the war. Otherwise, they knew that if the North ended up winning um, and they had helped the South, that would affect their relations with the United States over the course of time. So most of them just stayed on the sidelines um, and did not uh, acknowledge the South or participate. Okay, so our final essential question is what was the strategy of the North and what is the strategy of the South? So your left side question is what was the strategy? You'll have a North column, you'll have a South column. Let's talk about the Union strategy first. Uh, the North wanted to cut the South into sections and make it impossible to run as a single country. So basically the North's philosophy is we are gonna carve the South into pieces and make it so those pieces cannot connect and cannot interact with and cannot help each other. So the whole notion of divide and conquer, literally that was the Northern strategy. Uh, the Union wanted to control the seas and rivers of the South, making transportation impossible. So the North had a Navy, the South really didn't. First thing the North did was surround the South and initiate a blockade. So. Nothing could get in to the South or out from the South. So even if other countries wanted to help the South, they would essentially have to run the Union blockade to do it. Um, and that was nearly impossible. Uh, the North also wanted to gain control over the river system relatively quickly. And as you will discover, that eventually happened. Um, the North also wanted to use its technological advantage to outmaneuver the South, using the railroads to transport troops, using the telegraph to get real-time information from the battlefront and to send real-time orders to the battlefront was something that had never been done before. It used to be that generals were very, very independent because the leaders were hundreds of miles away and had no way to communicate with them. Not in this war. Abraham Lincoln was in the telegraph office getting real-time information about the war and troops could be moved very, very quickly using the railroad system. Uh, the South did not have that capacity. Uh, Lincoln uh, used the telegraph system to issue orders and get updates in real time. In fact, um, some of his generals felt he was a micromanager um, and got too involved. And ever since we've had technology, uh, the degree to which leaders have gotten too involved in military decisions has been a real sense of uh, stress and tension between leaders and uh, battlefield commanders. Uh, that was also an issue in the Vietnam War with uh, Lyndon Johnson. Uh, but you'll learn about that in high school. We'll, we'll save that for your high school teachers. Um, the North also used a scorched earth policy. So literally, they would go into southern cities and simply burn them to the ground. Uh, and this is where, you know, that sense that, hey, we, we were your countrymen here and you want us to be your countrymen again. 
and yet you're going to come in and absolutely destroy us and burn our cities to the ground. This was a risky strategy. From a military perspective, it made a lot of sense. From a healing after the war perspective, uh, not so much, because you're essentially destroying a part of your country that you then want to reattach to your country and somehow have them want to be part of your country after you've burned their cities to the ground. Um, that... Um, was definitely a thing, shall we say. And then finally, what was the strategy of the South? The South, like we said, their job was simply to survive. So um, the Confederacy did have a strategy, and this is what it was. First of all, the South wanted simply to protect its right to exist. So if the South could simply fight to a stalemate, meaning nobody wins, nobody loses, then they've won. So that's all they had to do was make it so the North could not invade them and take them over. They didn't need to invade the North or damage the North. They just needed to survive themselves. Um, the South did invade the North twice uh, at Antietam Creek and Gettysburg, but they didn't do that for military reasons. They did that for strategic reasons. And that was that they wanted northern citizens to essentially pressure the Union to stop prosecuting the war um, so that, you know, they could win that way. They, if they could break the will of the North to fight, then they could win that way. And uh, so the two battles we would talk about there would be Antietam Creek, Maryland, Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. We'll be learning about those soon. Those battles were an attempt to get the North to stop fighting the war. Uh, the South wanted to exploit the weaknesses and indecisiveness of northern military commanders. The North did not have very good military commanders. The South knew it, and they wanted to exploit that uh, as much as they could. And in the early stages of the war, they very much did. And finally, the South hoped that the victories against the North would earn it allies who would um, help them get better terms of trade uh, for Southern goods, especially the British. Uh, there was a point at which when the South looked like it was going to win, the British were just about to start diplomatic relations with the South and start helping them out. But right at that point, the tide of the war changed and uh, that never ended up happening. So ladies and gentlemen, this all together kind of gives you a preview uh, of what we're going to be learning about as we learn about the battles and events of the Civil War itself. And you should be able to compare and contrast the strengths, weaknesses, and strategies of the North and South. Uh, right now, I'd like you to do that in at least six sentences in a summary at the bottom of your Cornell notes because there have been six slides and six uh, essential questions to this presentation. And we will go ahead and share those summaries uh, with our classmates and allowed as a class uh, as soon as you have time to do that, either today or the next time we have class. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, it is time. You know what time it is. It is time once again for Mr. Blumendahl to sign off until next time on the Waldo Social Studies YouTube Network. Thanks for listening.